so yeah, this, this talk, I started to develop it a few months ago, and actually it's evolved quite a bit. Um, the basis of it was some research that we did for a, a government regulator in the UK, which I'll talk about later, um, investigating how social media companies are keeping people safe. But since then, um, things have evolved quite rapidly, as you know. So we already had the sort of beginnings of the online safety bill, which was the original sort of topic of this talk. But since then, we've had a lot of work through the, uh, a, a lot of interesting work from the EU's AI Act. So I've actually incorporated some slides on that because it's definitely relevant to this discussion of basically regulating AI. Um, so hopefully I'm going to get time to, to do that, to, to talk about at the end. Um, but also, we've had a, a bit of a proliferation of ChatGPT and, 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 and what's now deemed to be called foundation models as well. So that's it's, it's an evolving talk, really. Um, okay, and um, let's let's start with what the the current state of, of of social media is first. And what you'll read about most is the uh, the reduction, the the removal of. Um, trust and safety teams because of cost and pricing at the moment, because a lot of companies are starting to struggle uh, financially. And this isn't just people like Twitter, you know, so all these stories about Elon Musk removing vast swathes of teams that were dedicated to keeping people safe online, it's happening elsewhere as well. So more recently, you know, so recently that I haven't added a slide yet, but Reddit's been struggling because they've decided to lock down their APIs in order so, so people can't scrape it for free, which is fair enough from a, a business perspective. But the problem was that Reddit's moderation tools are apparently so rubbish that the moderators needed the APIs so people could build moderation tools on top. So as a, as a, as a, a manifestation or a, a, a reaction to that, they're all starting to... To, to leave the platform because effectively they say they're saying they can't moderate very well anymore. Um, and I wanted to sort of tackle this really early on actually because the number one argument against moderation and against safety is free speech. It's like we have the right to free speech. It's a very kind of entitled view. Um, but when you really start looking at the laws, the laws are already in place and they've been there for a long time. So in the UK, we have the Human Rights Act, which is basically a, a very similar law to the, uh, the European Convention in the, in the EU. And yes, it says that everyone has the right to freedom of expression and freedom of speech and freedom of ideas and things like that. But that's placed within the context of all the other laws that exist. Like, you can't say anything that will hurt somebody else because it's, it's hurtful, it's, it's, it's painful. You can't say things that are inciting you know, terrorism or violence and things because they're illegal in other laws that have been created to protect against that. So, yes, free speech is there, but it, it's, it's, it's not really free. And actually, there's, there's a, a, a big... In the UK especially, I'm not sure what it's like in Europe, but in the UK, it actually gets really complicated because there's lots of other laws that sort of impact those free speech laws as well. And um, there's a, an older law called the Public Order Act, which was written in 1986, and it specifically states that um, someone is uh, guilty of an offence, according to the Public Order Act, if they use threatening or abusive words or behavior in a, or, or disorderly behavior, including writing, sign, or the visual representation, that basically if anyone is, is likely to be caused harm by that, then, then, then that makes it illegal. And it's, and it's a much kind of lower penalty compared to uh, some other laws. The actual criminal uh, ramifications of that are not huge, but still, it's technically illegal to basically cause harm to anybody by saying something harmful. Um, and even, even, even before that, there's, and this is still in UK law, by the way, this is still, mo most laws in the UK, they kind of get built on and built on and built on, they never really get revoked. There's an act, Justices of the Peace Act, 1361, riotous and baritous, which is like, I, yes, I, it's not even used in English anymore. Uh, behavior that disturbs the peace of the king. So basically, if you piss off the king, if you upset the king, if you annoy the king, then you can be held uh, in, in, in contempt of this law. And you could technically still be prosecuted for it as well. Um, so yeah, going back to, to Twitter, like the, the, the fallout that, that Mr. Musk has had from all of that 
economic activity that has been going on at Twitter has kind of left it scarred a little bit, and there is now a, a quite reasonable perception that Twitter is no longer as safe as it was. There's lots of people that are currently trying to take them to court for various things. And uh, it's, it's, it's really quite important because in the UK, really, this is the, the catalyst, the thing that kind of kicked things off. And I kind of apologize in advance, actually, that most of the topics in this talk are actually quite sad and quite depressing and not very funny. So coming from the previous talk, you know, we're, not, we're now going downhill, I'm afraid. The, the catalyst was this, uh, this young girl called Molly Russell. And um, I forget specifically when the date was. Oh, it was 2017. Um, basically... Uh, and this was established in an inquest like years later, two years later. Basically what happened is she, she, she already had quite depressive tendencies. She wasn't very happy. And she used, it turns out she used Twitter, uh, sorry, Instagram and Pinterest. And through the content on those platforms, she started viewing things like romanticized acts of self-harm and uh, content that isolated and discouraged discussion of what she was feeling and things like that. And the inquest found that this content contributed to her death in a more than minimal way. So I think that that's actually really interesting in itself because it's very hard to prove any one thing that caused her death. And this is why nobody's been prosecuted for it. And this is why nobody's really been sued for it, because it's so hard to prove. But the inquest found that the content that she viewed materially affected her, her life. And really, this was, like I said, this was the catalyst that then spun, spun off the interest in the online safety bill. Um, this is from today, actually. I just saw this this morning, and I thought I'd add it. Um, we were, what, uh, so Stability AI is uh, one of our clients, one of the clients that we work with. And this is a story about an illegal trade in CSAM material using generative techniques. So using sort of stable diffusion light models, models that are capable of generating, generating images based upon prompts. And people are then reselling those images to other people. Um, and I think there's, there's quite a few sort of interesting things in this article, but one, one thing that I found I, I didn't quite realize, actually, is that a pseudo-image, they're calling a pseudo-image, but a, 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 an AI-generated image, is treated the same as a real image and is illegal to process. So one of the, um, the, the, the interesting aspects of CSAM law in, in the UK and most of the world, actually, is that it's illegal to, to transmit, to store, to see, to, to sell, to buy, any form of CSAM material. This is uh, child sexual exploitation and abuse material. Um, so, yeah, material relating to children, really. And, um, this, there, yeah, and, and, and apparently the law states that even a fake version of that is illegal to, to, to possess. Um, so that was quite interesting. But, yeah, of course, and the, the other thing that came out of this was that when we start talking about the online safety bill in a minute, we're usually talking about social media and things. So it's usually the focus is like the Facebooks, the Metas, the Twitters, it's, you know, the so on and so forth. But actually here, the, the route that these journalists found were people were using sites like Patreon and other um, like subscription services, uh, what do you call them? You know, when you, when you uh, fund like open source development, you use Patreon or, 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 or things like that. And they were using that as a mechanism to pay for CSAM material. So it's, I think that, that yeah, what's interesting is, is this is, this is going to expand. It's not just going to be social media platforms that have to deal with this kind of content. It's actually, yeah, going to be more widespread as well. Um, and it's okay bashing social media as well because they, you know, they do have faults and they do need to improve. But I want to kind of provide a little bit of a counter-argument. Um, and the counter-argument is it's a bit hypocritical of the government to impose laws on te technology companies when sometimes they can't even control their own government departments. 
Um, my, my wife's a teacher, so she's been through this process, so this is quite close to home. Ofsted is a, a government regulator in the UK that regulates education. They regulate schools, and they attempt to make sure that schools perform to a certain standard, like are they teaching the national curriculum, um, are children being kept safe, and things like that. And um, one of the ways in which they do that is every few years, usually two or three years, they come around and do a one-day inspection of the school. And they're looking for like absolute minutiae, like tiny little things, tiny little mistakes, which they then ex extrapolate into the bigger issue. And they've only got one day to do this because there's lots of schools and there's only so many people. Um, and so it has to be very quick and it has to be very rapid. And there's been a history over the past 10, 10 years, maybe, maybe even more, of increasing amounts of pressure for schools to pass this inspection. Because if they don't, then they get a, a one-word score that says inadequate. If they get that, then the parents don't send their children to inadequate schools. You know, you want to send your children to the best schools. So children stop going to that school, and then uh, eventually those schools don't have any children left, and then eventually those schools get shut down, and then the head teacher's career, it's even sometimes the teacher's career, is, is basically over because they took a school into this you know, death spiral. So there's a lot of pressure on them. Like my, my, when my wife last did it, like I was absolutely fuming actually because they, they ring up the day before to say that they're coming. And um, then they go into like this mad panic of trying to get everything ready. And so she's, she was staying up until like 3 a.m. in the morning, like getting everything ready. She had like three hours sleep and then drove back into school at 6 a.m. to go and meet the, the Ofsted inspectors there. Like even just driving there with three hours sleep is dangerous. But this is, this is the kind of pressure that is being placed upon teachers. And recently, uh, one of the head teachers committed suicide because of this. So the, the pressure that a government organization has placed upon a person has caused that person to commit suicide. That is literally the definition of harm. Okay? Um, and it's been happening for years. And one of the things that wound me up the most was when the report for that particular school came out, they included this section that I highlighted in yellow in the report, saying there's been a change of leadership at the school following the death of head teacher who was in post at the time of the inspection. It's like in incredibly insensitive. This is in an official government document that will be there forever. Um, yeah. So, yeah, and these are just, just a few names of, of other people that have committed suicide under similar circumstances. So it, it needs to change. Um, and I like to, you know, we're going to be talking about social media and, and big tech companies a lot, but it's, it's wider than that. The problem, the problem is, is, is bigger than that. Okay, so let's start talking about some legislation now. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how social media companies are attempting to, to solve this problem. The online safety bill is a, a piece of legislation in the UK that, um, in, that forces companies to be responsible for the content that they produce. They must remove all illegal content. Um, they must remove all of the content that contravenes their uh, terms and conditions. And then there's a couple of uh, extra stipulations in there to help um, parents and uh, children control what they see. Obviously, the, the, the actual bill is a lot longer than that. That's like a massively condensed version of what the, 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 the bill is. One of the most interesting questions that comes out of this is what is harm and what is illegal? And thankfully, most laws already have a very clear definition of what is legal and what is not. So there's a whole big list of things here, including CSAM right at the top. That was you know, one of the, the, the big drivers of this. Um, but there's, there's all sorts of other things that social media companies will have to start suppressing as well. Things like, um, yeah, I don't know, yeah, selling drugs and weapons, Terrorism, you know, I think that's already pretty obvious, but fraud, actually, that's, that's going to be a really tricky one for them to solve because fraud is, is kind of very sub subjective. Um, but that is on the list of illegal content. They have to be, uh, be able to remove fraudulent content or, or content that promotes fraud. Um, and there's a couple of ramifications here. Um, basically, there's a big fine 
or a big percentage. Actually, we'll come back to that at the end. Um, yeah, Ofcom will have the power to uh, require payment providers and advertisers and internet service. Basically, Ofcom will have the power to shut the, the funding mechanisms for that country down, which is interesting um, from a from a sort of internet freedom perspective. I mean, we, we, we all know that governments have the capability to kind of shut things down when they want to, but living in the West, we think that we're, we're okay. That would never happen. We live in a, a free country, but here, still. Anyway, um, and it doesn't matter where company's based. It doesn't matter if you're based in the UK or if you're uh, not. Basically, if you're exposing content to a UK person, you will still have to abide by this law. That's really interesting because um, Sometimes some companies don't have a, a representation in, in that country. So if a website or a, uh, say, say a website or a certain social media platform from China um, contravened any of these laws, how is the UK going to try and prosecute that company or those people? That's going to be a big challenge for them. But apparently they, the, the, the law says that they can do it. And then it comes back to the actual fines. So we already have several tech laws in place that fine, fine companies based upon uh, a percentage of income. This is one of the biggest, 10% of annual global income. 10%. So for some of the large companies, that is a massive figure. Absolutely extraordinary. And also, and this is probably the, the newest and most litigious part of the law, Senior managers in that company are criminally liable for not adhering to these practices. So at the moment, if you contravene GDPR or any of the laws that already exist, the company can get fined, but that's it. Now they're going to place a burden on, well, I should say they're proposing, they're proposing to place a, a, a regulatory burden on individuals in that company that would be held criminally responsible if they weren't able to act, basically. So technically, they could go to prison. And this, there, is, um, there is precedent in this for the UK. The FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority, they have uh, a, a law that forces financial companies to name an individual that is responsible for all of the laws under the, the FCA regulation. And if the company doesn't succeed, then that person gets put on a blacklist. And that person's then never allowed to hold uh, a directorship. They're not allowed to be a director in a company, at least a financial one. They're not allowed to uh, be part of a financial company anymore. So it's not criminal, but it does kind of have the potential for destroying people's uh, you know, livelihoods if they were to, to be found to, to be doing illegal stuff. So there's a bit of a precedent there already, but. This is criminal. This is criminal law, criminal case. And that, I think that's, that's probably one of the first in, in, in the world, actually. OK, so let's start talking a little bit about scale now. So this is, so OK, so we've got a definition of what is harmful. We've got a definition of what is illegal-ish. And it's now up to social media companies to start to enforce that and enact that. So how do you do it? These are some numbers that I captured from the various websites of, uh, of, of Meta and Twitter um, about the amount of content that they are removing over a period of time. Um, Facebook have been a little bit ahead of the, the curve on this. They've been doing it for quite a long time. Twitter were doing it. They're not anymore. They're not reporting any numbers of how much content they're removing anymore since, uh, you know, since whatever, since a certain date. And just to sort of put this into scale, there's this six point, uh, I think this is in, uh, in Facebook, 6.4 billion actions over all categories. So this is like basically all of the things, all of the, the models and things that are acting over all of the content that is produced on Facebook. And um, this, uh, on, on average, for about 400 removals every second. So every single second, there's 400 pieces of content that is immediately removed because it violates their policies according to their models at, their, at, at that particular point in time. Um, so obviously, you, you, you can't do this with human power alone. You, know, you need to automate this. There's just too much content at this scale. So how do you do it? 
of AI, of course. And so this is where we came in. Um, so Ofcom, the, the regulator that I've kind of half mentioned throughout this, they're the people that are being given the responsibility to police this and to help companies to adhere to the online safety bill when it comes into place. Um, but Ofcom are a telecommunications regulator. They know about frequencies and bandwidth and mobile phones and telephone masts, you know, they don't, they don't know about AI and stuff like that. So um, they're, they're rapidly trying to upskill in order to, uh, to be able to sort of deal with this at the moment. And we, we helped them produce a report um, that investigated how social media companies are doing this at the moment. Um, and we produced a, a public version of that report, which you can get on, on our website. Um, and one of the things that we were mostly interested in was not necessarily like the specific algorithms, like how they specifically uh, detect and, and, and generate and, uh, yeah, sorry, how they predict and, and find content. We were more interested in the processes and the procedures that were in place um, to, to, to manage those algorithms and to manage those processes. And that's where there's a, a field called MLOps, machine learning operations. It's basically the, uh, the, the art of, of developing and deploying and managing AI systems at scale. And there's a whole sort of wide range of fields within that, um, some which are listed here. And based upon these categories, we started asking lots of questions like, how do you do this? What do you use for that? What tooling do you use for this? Uh, how, how often does it happen? What are your processes and things like that? Collecting all of these answers and then presenting it in a report. So, yeah, I've basically just done that, so I'll just skip that. So we, um, so we interviewed a wide range of these companies. It did include all of the major social media platforms, but it also included a lot of smaller ones as well. Because like I mentioned earlier, this, this, all of the talk is always about the large platforms because they have the, the, the biggest number of users and the biggest scale and all of this. And, and I guess that manifests as the, you know, the most likely source of harm. You know, if, if everybody uses Facebook, then it's quite likely that if something were to happen, it was, it's probably going to be on Facebook. But there's a whole sort of wide range of smaller companies that are kind of around the scenes. Anything from forums, you know, like s small, close-knit communities of people, Patreon, uh, maybe even GitHub, you know, cr crazy places like that that are not necessarily social media platforms, but will still have to attempt to remove harf harmful content. Um, we also looked at uh, platforms in specific genres as well. So, for example, we spoke to quite a few companies that are in the, the adult industry, which have a, a particularly like, specific set of challenges when it comes to, um, you know, so, so for example, a small forum, it's quite easy to build a model that just bans all form of, of pornography, basically. Uh, but when, if you are a company that actively offers pornography as a service, then your models have to be a lot more nuanced in what's, what's harmful and what's not, because there's some crazy shit out there. <laughs> um, so, and then we also talked to some moderation vendors as well and industry experts. So this is kind of a wide range of, of uh, sort of general findings based on all of that. Now, th there was a lot of content in that report. And it's incredibly difficult to make a summary of that report, but also make it fun, because it, does, it literally ends up being a list of bullet points. So I'm, I'm really, really sorry. I'll, I'll try and go through this a little bit faster, because there is more interesting things to talk, to, talk about. Um, basically, a lot of the, the, the larger platforms have very, very specialized and dedicated systems to work with data. Data is their raw resource. Um, you'd be surprised actually how little emphasis is put on the modeling phase of the life cycle these days. Generally, most of the larger platforms have like well-researched and robust and pretty much automated modeling and training techniques. All of the focus is on the data. Like, how do we get better data? How do we, how do we, uh, how do we create better data sets effectively? Um, a lot of them have built their own data platforms and entire data systems and architectures, which have gradually been open, open sourced over the years. You can, you know, you can probably guess what, what those are. 
Um, oh, it, yeah, interesting. So one of the biggest challenges still is, is generating the data and specifically annotating that data. So say, imagine you found some harmful content. How would you tag that to define what the truth is in that data? For a text message, like, it's probably fairly straightforward. You, know, you can tag it to, to, to certain categories. Uh, for an image, even, you can probably have a human to annotate it and tag it to certain categories. But a lot of these platforms are now dealing with video, and some of the annotation schemes that have to happen in video are really quite complicated because you've not just got static images with content and categories anymore. You've got time as well. So you've got to go through frame by frame and try and figure out what's going on. One particularly interesting uh, story that someone talked about was models at the moment have a really hard time of inferring what is behind uh, a, a, a blockage in the scene. So for example, if you've got, um, uh, if, if you've got a piece of card and ho hold it in front of the video camera, the model has a hard time trying to guess what is behind that. So for example, you could just see my face here if I'm just stood behind the thing. Like, I, I could be completely naked right now. You'd never know, because all you can see is my head. And so people are investing a lot of time in investing in data sets that make it easier for models to kind of infer things from the context and also sort of track things as people are moving about. So if I just move my shoulders above the, 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 the podium here and saw that my shoulders were also um, you know, not, not covered, then you could maybe infer that the rest of my body was not covered as well. So particularly challenging when it comes to, yeah, automatically annotating and moderating videos. Uh, yeah, I've already kind of mentioned that. Yeah, uh, I think one of the most in interesting things about the deployment was, especially in the larger companies, they were doing development in production. There, there is kind of, there was, there was no dev staging prod-like approach anymore because they're not changing software. They're basically just doing experiments on live data. You can think of it as that. They're experimenting on live data. And so they deploy a new model or a new idea into production directly, and then do kind of, you know, a, a, effectively A-B testing on some proportion of the traffic and, and, and see what happens. And then they take um, actions based upon the results of that little experiment. Um, so that was quite interesting to note. Um, I think the most sort of interesting thing in this section is that many of the small to medium sized platforms were attempting to use vendors and third party providers to deal with the you know the proliferation of of the uh, of these of this legislation and um, the challenge there especially with some companies is that the these algorithms still need to be trained on their data. Each individual platform has a very unique data set, and it's very hard to take uh, any algorithm and say, we can prevent harmful content on your platform because there'll be so many false positives, there'll be so many you know, missed opportunities that they end up having to basically retrain that, that model with their specific data. And we had one example of a company that said, we've been trying to integrate this tool for one year, and it's still not finished and it's cost an extraordinary amount of time and money in order to do that. So yeah, it's not easy. And talking of costs, um, one platform, one medium-sized platform said that they were spending 10 million a year just on the team, just on the team to try and achieve this. Um, so it's not, it's not cheap. Um, in terms of the, the vendors offering, again, there was kind of a, a wide range of servicing from like volume pricing, like API-like pricing, all the way up to like, in, like enterprise pricing. And this, there's some big numbers involved there. Um, it, it, we talked a lot about governance as well, because it forms a, 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 an integral part of any AI solution, is how you ensure that you have processes in place to maintain it and, and continue to develop it. And actually, this was a massive challenge because when I talk about governance, I think about like, I, I talk about technical governance, like what technical things do you do to manage your technical operations? But of course, when I, when, whenever you use the word governance, the lawyer's ears just prick up and they go, oh, they're talking about governance. 
And as, as soon as they said that word, literally an army of lawyers walked into the call. And you're just like, pling, 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 pling. And you've got all of these new faces that wouldn't show their faces, just, you know, just I, I, anonymous. And, it, and it's all the lawyers that have, have heard that we're talking about governance and are worried that they're going to be talking about corporate governance, not technical governance. So unfortunately, we, we, it was, we didn't, we, we really struggled to talk about the technical governance aspects at all, um, which is a real shame because I think it's one of the most important parts of the, the problem. So I think like if I was to sort of feed back to them, like you need to separate out your corporate governance and your technical governance because corporate governance, I get it, you know, it's, it's important to the business and whatever. Technical governance is totally different. Like this is, this is, this is an engineering task, you know, you should be, you should be treating it as such. Um, in terms of the, the challenges that they, that we, we also gave the, the social media platforms an opportunity to kind of air the challenges that they're facing to basically ask the regulators, like, can, can you help us with this? This is what we need help with. Um, and the number one was, is like the definitions of harm, the definition of illegal content, like how illegal does it have to be? How, how potentially harmful does it have to be? And that, that's all, that, it's always gonna be a tricky one to solve because those, those thresholds change on an individual basis. You know, it's an opinion, what I think is harmful, you might not, or, or, or vice, vice versa. So, um, yeah, no easy answer to that, except the law. The law is very clear in what's illegal. Um, yeah, what, uh, what else was there? A couple of interesting things here. Um, the data retention policies. Ah, yeah. <clears throat> so an interesting aspect is that the online, uh, online safety bill is going to have to live in an ecosystem with other laws. One of those other laws is GDPR. And GDPR says that you're not allowed to hang on to data for too long, for longer than, 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 than necessary. And um, inside like the online safety bill and the EU AI Act that we're gonna come to in a second, there are parts of that um, law that state that you have to be able to effectively explain and reproduce the experiments that generated the models in the first place. But the, uh, the, the, the social media platforms are throwing away data like it's nobody's business because there's A, there's just too much of it. They can't store all of it. It's just, it's just too much data. And, and B, GDPR. They don't want to hold on to it because it's a liability for them. So it's impossible to recreate many of the models that are in, in existence today because the original training data has been deleted according to other laws. Um, what else was there? Oh yeah, this is a great one. Right, so in India, there is a law uh, stating how you should show the national flag. And if you don't show the national flag in a very specific way, then you can go to prison. If you, <laughs> it's, I know it sounds funny, but it's really important to the Indian government. Um, you can go to prison. There's been cases of like officials showing the Indian flag upside down and stuff and getting in serious trouble for it. And one of the platforms that we spoke to, that one challenge that they've got is the massive hyper-localization of all of the laws that they have to adhere to. Every single country has a crazy law like this, if you think this is a crazy law. Apologies if it's not a crazy law, but anyway. Every single country has laws like this that these companies have to, supposedly, have to adhere to. So, you know, the, you end up building thousands and th tens of, hundreds of thousands of hyper-specific models saying, is this the Indian flag and is it upside down? If yes, delete post. You know, can you imagine how many models you have to create to kind of deal with all of these? Yeah. Okay, time check. All right, we're, we're, doing, we're doing okay. I wanted to talk a little bit about the EU AI Act because I think it's, it's interesting and relevant as well. Um, similar kind of ideas here, fines if you don't do what we're telling you to do, slightly less this time, 7% of annual turnover. Um, but yeah, what's, what's interesting here? So let's, let's do a bit of a comparison. The online safety bill is saying, is, is, is placing rules on companies to, sh to not show specific types of content. They're not saying how you do that. You can do that however you want. You can, you do, you can use an if statement. You can use a neural network. You can do whatever you want. 
but it's just the content that's important. The EU AI Act, on the other hand, is not bothered about the content, it's the specific applications that are being targeted and sometimes the specific models that are being used. So slightly different focuses. Um, the AI Act has several categories. Basically, uh, there's one category which is prohibited technologies and applications. There's then a second category called high risk. And then there's a third category which is like, un like undefined. Not no risk, but undefined. There are a range of things that are prohibited. So this means you are not allowed to do this in the EU. Um, anything that, you know, I think is pretty obvious for, the, for some of them, purpose, purposely manipulative, exploits vulnerabilities. But then it gets a bit more specific. Classifying or scoring natural persons. Now, we all know that whenever you involve personal information, and whenever the application is to do with something to do with individuals or real people, then you have problems, you have biases, you have yeah, all sorts of ramifications that can be really quite hard to, 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 to deal with. And this is the first piece of law that's kind of saying it's basically illegal to use any, any algorithm that is attempting to classify or score an individual, which is a hugely broad range, by the way. Um, there's also a few things um, that law enforcement are going to be prohibited from using. Specifically, um, there's, it's, not, it's not all applications of AI, but it's specifically stuff to do with the judiciary. Um, so anything that's to do with like sentencing or anything like that, no algorithms must be used, which is uh, another like really interesting uh, thing. Um, yeah, expanding facial recognition data sets. This is a real, this is a really odd one actually. Um, they've added that in there recently, and they're effectively saying that it's now illegal to collect a data set of people's faces from whenever this law comes into effect, which is kind of a, a little bit odd um, because it's not banning facial recognition systems; it's just banning the collection of it. Which, yeah, I, I don't quite understand the reasoning behind that. And then sort of more things to do with people, detecting emotions, physical, physiological features, uh, facial expressions, movement, pulse frequency. So it's all very sort of focused on the individual. Illegal to use algorithms to work upon an individual. When you move into the high risk category, there's a whole other sort of list of things there. And again, they're equally broad. Anything to do with employment, so all of, this, all of this hype that you've been hearing about like recruitment-related chatbots, recruitment-related stuff, like they're not illegal, but there are a large number of hoops that the companies are going to have to jump through in order to make use of them, and they will be investigated. Uh, education, credit scoring, like I, I'm amazed at that one because obviously that's a, a huge part of the banking system is credit scoring. So uh, yeah, they're, they're going to have to pull the fingers out and start you know, doing the things. Law enforcement, not more generally, everything to do with law, and everything to do with policing, facial recognition, ANPR, anything like that that's taken for granted now will have to go through this process. Border control, justice, and some really interesting new amendments. So this, again, this, this law isn't in act yet. This, this law hasn't been enacted. Uh, it's still going through the revision process, and people just, like Wikipedia, like people keep adding crazy things, and then people keep deleting them again. A couple of crazy things that have been um, added recently, and well, not crazy, in a sense, social media recommendation algorithms. I think that's a really, really good addition because I've heard many stories of people going into huge, like, cult conspiracy spirals just purely down to the recommendation algorithm. It's related to the online safety bill as well. You know, you start looking at depressive content, it keeps promoting depressive content. Um, but probably one of the most controversial ones is foundation models, and that's the word that they use for any model that is used in a derivative model. So all of the GPTs, all of the llamas, all of the, you know, any of the, the, the fancy, uh, stable diffusion, you know, any of these models that are used as foundation models for the products would have to go through this process as well. It also includes open source models. So, I, I mean, good luck trying to prosecute a, an open source community for a model that they release, but yeah, the, it, it, it is included. Um, so what do you need to do in order to, 
to uh, uh, when when you are working on a high risk application, um, you have to go through this process. And basically, it's a case of you have to register with a government regulator, and the government regulator has the right to audit and ask information of you. And effectively, you have to demonstrate that you have the tools and the processes in place to successfully manage and operate such a system at scale. And it's a lot of it is MLOps in the AI space. Um, OK, no, I think we're, 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 we're about bang on time. So in terms of what's next then, so the, uh, due to the, the, the unique legal foundation in which democracy is built upon in the UK, there's two sets of, 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 of bodies in Parliament. They've got the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Um, the, that's, that's a whole different discussion that we should have a, a debate about later on. Um, it's currently in the House of Lords, so this is like the second tier of, of government in the UK. Um, they're currently making amendments like MAD and scribbling things out and bringing it back. Um, it's nearly done. I think it's scheduled to be done in July, and then it will go back to the House of Commons to, to sort of be finally ratified and then placed into law. So they're kind of currently aiming for later on this year, the online safety bill will start to come into effect. Um, so probably by 2024, uh, this will, uh, the online safety bill will be in, in, in effect. For the EU AI Act, that's kind of following a similar trajectory, but you know, di different set of processes in the EU in order to enact a bill. Um, but that's probably on a similar time scale as well. So we don't have long. And uh, I, yeah, I think the proverbial poop is going to hit the fan quite, quite quickly once these come into, um, into effect. And um, I think with, with that, that's, that's it. <laughs>